Hi, my name is Gar Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Kylie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Guy. Great to be here. I'm, I'm very excited or genuinely excited to have you on the show today. I am... Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's because I'm living near Byron Bay, <laughs> but um, the topic of um, medicinal cannabis comes up a lot. And I get asked a lot as well because I've worked in the wellness space for a long time. Sure. Um, you know, and I kind of seen it all in my time and interviewed a lot of people. Mm. And I mean, I, it just seems to be a, a talking point more and more. So mm. I thought... I've got to get an expert on the show that definitely knows way more than I will ever know. So, uh, so I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no problem. So my first question is, and I always um, ask this on the show, so I might as well ask you, is yeah. that if you were on an airplane sitting next to a stranger and they asked you what you did for a living, what would you say? Uh, yeah, I, I would just uh, say that I'm now working very much in the medicinal cannabis space. So Primarily, a lot of my role is, is um, working in education, so educating doctors and other healthcare practitioners about the evidence base around medicinal cannabis. And I run courses for doctors on, on how to prescribe it. So that's a lot of what I, I do. I also do, um, I've become involved in some research into medicinal cannabis. And I also do consultancy to um, some of the private companies as well. So. I wear a few different hats, I guess. Yeah, and, and I feel like I'll be, I'd be sitting right next to you on the plane right now because my eyes would light up. And the next logical question, well, actually, how do people react when you tell them that? If yeah, it's funny because uh, people who know me know that I've got a, an academic background, so I guess they don't think I'm too sort of, I haven't gone too mad. But other people, you can sort of see them go, oh, oh. You know, so depending on, I guess, their openness to it, it either shuts them up or they start to ask questions. Yeah, okay. And I'd be definitely the one asking the questions, just yeah. like today. Yeah. So why medicinal cannabis? Why start to look at that in the first place? Mm. Look, it was interesting. My background, I was originally an optometrist, um, career changed into Chinese medicine via a master in public health. I did my PhD at Monash Medical School in, in Chinese herbal medicine. Um, and I'd have to say that it's one of the most fascinating herbs I've ever come across. Now, a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine, Professor Ian Brighthope, who set up the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine over 30 years ago, came to me and he said, look, we've got an issue here. Um, medicinal cannabis is an important, um, um, you know, it's an important herb, um, but there's a problem. It's become legalised, so it's legal to prescribe it um, in Australia now, in 2016, they legalised that. However, um, doctors don't know anything about it and there's a problem with them becoming um, what they call authorised prescribers of medicinal cannabis. So there's a system set up whereby they become authorised prescribers, but they need to get an ethics committee to approve them first. Um, and then the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, makes the final approval. But there were no, um, no, in the country, there were no um, um, specialist colleges or ethics committees doing that process, or approving them. So I happened to be working at the National Institute of Complementary Medicine, at, uh, sorry, National Institute of Integrative Medicine at the time, NIM. So sorry, I do actually wear a couple of hats. I am a fellow of the National Institute of Complementary Medicine too. But in Melbourne, I was working at the National Institute of Integrative Medicine, NIM. And I um, was on the ethics committee, so I set up the process by which uh, doctors could apply through the NIM ethics committee and then go on to seek approval through the TGA. So that was one of the reasons I got into um, this in the first place was to help that process out. And then because there weren't any real education courses or not much around um, for doctors about the evidence base of cannabis, and how to prescribe it, I also set those up when I was um, at NIM. And then when I moved out of NIM last year, I started running educational courses through a not-for-profit organisation called Global Health Initiative Australia. Wow. Okay, there you go. Uh, long story, but that's how I got no, into it. Yeah, no, and, and the, you know what occurred to me then as well was like, when you started looking into this, did yeah. you just go in like an open book, not sure, and just think, right, uh, or were you already surprised by what it was? Or what did you... 
Look, I came in totally as an, uh, an open book because um, even though it's been um, used as part of, um, I guess, Chinese medicine centuries ago, it's, it's not used um, much in the Chinese Materia Medica commonly. They do use the seeds of cannabis in one of the, the more famous prescriptions called Mazarin one. But apart from that, it really isn't something that's part of, I guess, our training as Chinese medicos. So um, I guess I came in with a totally open mind about it. And when I started to read the scientific literature, I thought, wow, there's an awful lot of, of evidence already here that it works and the mechanisms by which it does work as well. And because I'm, you know, I've got a background as a clinical researcher too, then I am very much interested in the evidence base um, you know, of medicines, including herbs. And as I dug deeper, I'd have to say that this has become, for me, probably the most fascinating herb I've ever come across. There you go. Wow. And I guess we should get into then what is cannabis? Because I automatically, like growing up, right, I think of yeah. Bob Marley or yes. something, you know, like you just kind of indoctrinated with this kind of belief system yes. around it. And you yes. just, just, you know, it's something that you get high with and, and kind right. of, you know, so why don't yeah. we start there first? Exactly yeah. what is cannabis? Because yeah. I think there's yeah. a bit of confusion. Well, look, you know, cannabis is, is a plant, cannabis sativa. And um, I guess there's a bit of argument about the, the naming of it that they call taxonomy, but two main subspecies. So cannabis sativa subspecies sativa and cannabis sativa subspecies indica. So some of them have got more um, intoxicating ability and others don't. And there are many, many different, what they call cultivars of strains of cannabis. So for the recreational market, you're talking about Bob Marley, and I've actually just come back from talking at a conference in Jamaica a oh, wow. last week ago. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they breed particular strains for the recreational market so that they've got high um, amounts of the key intoxicating um, component called THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. But that's only one of the, the active constituents in the plant. And so um, for the medicinal market, they may not be so much interested in, in necessarily high THC. They want other active constituents in there as well. Right. So um, I guess in the, to, to summarise, in the recreational market, they want high THC. In the medicinal cannabis space, that's not, so, that's not always so important. Got it. So, so for me, just to simplify that in my own head, is that you've got this whole cannabis plant. Yep. It's got, I don't know, a lot of different properties that are all very medicinal. And then you've got this one active component, THC, yep. mm. which is the part that gets you high. But then right. in Western culture, we've kind of neglected the rest of the plant. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh, oh. So right. we've got um, THC is one, what they call phytocannabinoid. Phyto just means plant cannabinoid but you've got 120 of them. And you've got other components called terpenes, so they're like essential oils, and they give the, the different strains of cannabis their characteristic smell. So if you've got a lot of alpha pinene, which is one of the terpenes, it's gonna smell a bit like pine. If you've got limonene, it's gonna smell a bit more lemonish. So um, all those constituents have got their own therapeutic actions, if you like. Okay. So even though you hear a lot about THC, and the other main cannabinoid that's been researched is called cannabidiol, CBD. There are actually, as I said, 120 odd phytocannabinoids or about 11 classes of them. So, you know, we tend to get hung up on just these two. Got it. So even though there's 120 of them and CBD and THC are the ones that we see a lot of. So I've right. got, got to ask you then, what's a cannabinoid? Just for anyone that doesn't know. It's just a, 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 chemi a name for the chemical component, which they've characterised. That, that's all it is. So they've got 11 classes of them. And as I said, um, around 120 have been sort of wow. the, chemical um, uh, the chemical structure of them rather has been um, found. Okay. And is yeah. it, so how does then, I, I guess my next logical question is, how yeah. does that then, how do we benefit from that? Okay, so I guess to understand that, you've got to go back to, I guess, the basics of the fact that in our own body, we actually make cannabinoids ourselves. Okay. This is called, we have what's called an endocannabinoid system. And I guess there's three main components to that. We've got receptors for it in our different parts of our body. Um, and we've got endocannabinoids. So they're chemicals that we make within our own bodies on demand. 
and one of them is called anandamide. And ananda, I think in Hindi means bliss. Um, mm. Another one has got quite a long name, but I'll shorten it to 2AG. And there are a few others there. And then you've got the proteins that are involved in synthesizing these endocannabinoids and metabolizing and breaking them down. So that's basically our endocannabinoid system. And we've got this system because it's responsible for homeostasis or maintaining balance of most of our bodily functions. Like it modulates our immune system, it modulates metabolism and energy, um, inflammation, pain, our emotions, our digestion, and nerve or neural plasticity, um, the development of the embryo, you know, and lots of other functions in our body. So we've got our own system in our body. And under normal circumstances, we've got relatively low levels of these endocannabinoids, but they get synthesized on demand um, in response to, I guess, stimuli like pain, like stress, inflammation, even exercise, things like that. Wow. So we have our own system. And so when we understand that we've got our own system, then it's more easy to understand how these phytocannabinoids actually sort of work. Because the, um, the receptors, um, that we have for our own endocannabinoids, THC, for example, mimics anandamide and 2-AG that, that we make ourselves. So it basically locks in or links into the receptor and then activates the receptor in that way. Got it. So, mm. that, so okay, I'm going to just try and put that into my own words again for myself mm. and the listeners. Yep. So the way I see it, and I am because I teach meditation and I, I hold people at retreats and things. And yep. one of the big components from my aspect is actually resetting the homeostasis because yes. we constantly operate from the hormones of stress. Yes. And it's almost like we condition yep. the body that way and it yep. becomes so familiar that mm. that's how we perceive it to be. But mm. from my past experience, inflammation mm is a huge component of all illnesses it if it becomes chronic. You're absolutely correct. So the way I'm seeing that then, if uh, uh, the cannabinoid system influences the homeostasis, then influences stress and inflammation, yes. that's how it's kind of operating, is that's that right. it's allowing us to support the cannabinoids we're producing that we're not producing enough of. Yes. Yes. Ourselves. So they think that a lot of chronic illnesses are associated with either a dysfunction or a deficiency in our own endocannabinoid system. Wow. That's huge when you think about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, no, look, I... you know, it's only in relative recent times that they actually discovered the endocannabinoid system. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's very interesting. But, you know, when you understand that the receptors, for, we've got two types of receptors mostly. Um, although there might be a third or, or fourth one, you know, the, I guess the jury's out on whether they're actually cannabis, uh, you know, cannabinoid receptors mm. or not. But CB1 receptors, for example, are in our central nervous system, our brain and our spinal cord, as well as some of the organs in our body. And then they have CB2 receptors and they are more distributed in our immune cells. So uh, again, you know, we, we've got them all over our body, in other words. And so when they're in our immune system, you can understand how they'll you know, help with our, our general well-being and, and um, you know, yeah. inflammation and things like that. Got it. Got it. So, so what, I mean, with all the, 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 the science-based evidence now and the studies mm. that are coming out, yep. who, who would generally, gra would you just gravitate to CBD and THC or are there other ways of doing it? I guess I'm asking two <laughs> questions here. Yep. And then who benefits from it most? Where do we see the studies where it's been applied yeah. to? Okay, so I guess in answering what kind of conditions that um, people seek cannabis for, they've done a few surveys okay. um, and there's many different conditions, I guess, so that it can be used for. And the evidence um, varies from a lot of evidence to a little bit of, of evidence, if you like. But here are some of the conditions. I mean, chronic pain, inflammatory conditions, chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, epilepsy, mental health conditions like anxiety and depression, glaucoma, nerve or neurological conditions like Parkinson's and MS. So they did a study in Australia um, in 2016 and it was just um, prior to legalisation of medicinal cannabis and it was done by a great researcher called Professor Nick Lanceris at University of Sydney. And they basically surveyed um, people who'd been using cannabis for medicinal purposes. And on average, they'd been um, using it for around about 10 years. 
perspective. And they asked them why they were using it. And the most common reasons were anxiety, around 50% were using it for anxiety, back pain, around about 50%, depression, 49%. Um, sleep disorders, 45%, neck pain and post-traumatic stress disorder. Wow. So, and they said, you know, in the survey, respondents said 80% um, of them indicated that this medicinal cannabis effectively managed their target symptoms. So there's research also in, in the United States, of course, and that showed sort of similar results in that they did a study called the Washington State um, University Survey and they found the most frequently reported conditions for use of cannabis were pain, 61%, anxiety, 58%, depression, 50%, headache, and migraine, nausea, muscle spasticity. And those respondents um, reported an 86% reduction of the symptoms and not, almost 60% said that they used it as an alternative to pharmaceutical medications. So it's interesting what you can you know, derive, I guess, from, from surveys, if you like. Yeah. So um, I know in, in the US, there's about, um, in 2017 at least, there were 14 medical conditions that were approved by the different state legislatures um, as qualifying conditions for medicinal cannabis. Wow. They've got a slightly different system over there and that each of the states that allow um, medicinal cannabis have qualifying conditions um, for which you can apply to be prescribed cannabis. Every every symptom you mentioned there, I'm like, oh, I know somebody with that. Oh, back pain, uh, right. poor sleep, insomnia, anxiety. Right. You know, it's it's yes. such a common. Yeah. Um, so what? I don't I don't know if you've looked at the studies around this, but what's mm. with the the uh, I guess let, let's take pain. Pain is a big one, or chronic yeah. pain for people. Yep. Yep. Um, what's the, the the normal application currently in Australia for or, or America with yep. the medicine? Well, I guess, um, I mean, a lot of people use opioids, um, you know, for, for, you know, management of pain, et cetera. And I guess the problem with that is that they are addictive and they've been associated with a lot of um, deaths and overdoses. So I guess that's probably an area where it shows, I guess, promise that um, medicinal cannabis might be able to be used um, to decrease the use of, of um Opiates. I mean, look, we do have an opioid crisis. It's well, in, well um, written about in, in the US, in, in Australia, in other countries. I mean, I read a TGA paper that reported between 2011 and 2015, you know, we had around 2,000 deaths um, associated with some of these, these drugs. So, um, you know, there are some studies, and again, yeah. most of them are in the US, um, that... Um, indicate that, that the use of um, cannabis with opioids might be able to reduce um, you know, their use or the amount of opioids right. that they can, can, they can use. And states in the US that have legalized the use of it, they did a study and said, well, um, you know, is there a relationship between hospitals related to um, opioid pain relievers and marijuana in those states that have legalized it compared to those who haven't? And they found that medical marijuana legalisation um, was associated with a 23% reduction in hospitalisations related to opioid dependence. And they found a 13% reduction in hospitalisations due to opiate um, overdose. So that study was published in 2017. So uh, it gives some indication, I guess the researchers concluded that medical marijuana policies were associated significantly with reduced hospitalizations, but they weren't, uh, they didn't find any associations with marijuana uh, related hospitalizations. So some of those studies start to sort of indicate, you know, and you can criticize that study because there are other factors that could have been involved yeah. there. But, you know, when you start to give, build a bank of evidence, you start to think, well, you know, perhaps it is useful. Now, the National Academies of um, Sciences, Engineering and, and Medicine put out a report in 2017, and it really looked at the evidence base from what they call systematic reviews and randomised controlled trials. So a systematic review just means that you grab all the randomised controlled trials and basically pull them together and come up with an answer, does this work or doesn't it work? And they looked at um, medicinal cannabis and cannabinoids, and they said, well, which ones have got the strongest evidence? Now, they found chronic pain, 
chemo-induced nausea and vomiting and spasticity associated with MS, um, that there was conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids were effective in those three conditions. They found a moderate level of evidence for sleep disorders, um, short-term sleep disorders um, associated with a, a range of other um, conditions. And the other medical conditions I looked at, they had less convincing evidence. But we've got to remember, this is a systematic, you know, systematic review, mm -hmm. which pools the data and it's randomised controlled trials. They're not the only forms of evidence that something works. Yeah, right. But it does show fairly strong evidence um, about chronic pain, going back to your original question. Yeah, which is huge, again. And I, I think of people I know directly in my life with chronic pain that are using medication right now, you know, which I guess would then lead me to the next question, mm. is where is Australia at with this right now? And yep. um, the hurdles that I, somebody that could be listening to this. Yeah to find somebody that then could have it prescribed to, to help their pain sure. management? Yeah, well, as I said, it's been um, legalised uh, for medical use since 2016. Mm -hmm. And if a patient wants to um, have it prescribed, you've got to have it prescribed by a doctor because CBD, cannabidiol, um, which is non-intoxicating, um, it's a Schedule Four drug in this country, and THC is considered a controlled substance at Schedule Eight. So it means that the doctor then has to either apply to the TGA through what's called the Special Access Scheme. So that's a one-on-one -on -one scheme where the patient comes in and, and they have to have exhausted other possibilities first before they are supposed to prescribe it. Um, they have to apply to the TGA. If that medicinal cannabis product has got any THC in it, then um, they also need to apply to the state health department for permission as well. Right. And thankfully, it's now just one online form. But it, as I said, it's a bit of paperwork for the doctor. The other way that the doctor can prescribe is to become an authorised prescriber of medicinal cannabis, which means they apply to prescribe specific products for specific conditions. They have to submit an application to an ethics committee like the, the one that I described before, the National Institute of Integrative Medicine. Um, if they are approved there, then they send that ethics committee letter onto the TGA and then they're approved. And they have to report every six months to the TGA and the ethics committee as well. But if a doctor decides that they want to change um, you know, the, the product that they're using, for example, and they want to try something else and they haven't been approved for that, they have to go back to the ethics committee for an amendment and then back to the TGA for further approval. If they want to prescribe for a different medical condition, again, they have to go back to the ethics committee and back to the TGA. So you can see how that can become a pretty onerous process. I was going to doctors. say that could be a, a bit of a pain. Like, yeah. are a lot of doctors taking this on board? As Look, there's, I, there are some early adopters, but overall, no, not a lot. I think um, when you look at the authorised prescriber scheme, at last count, um, a few months ago at least, there were probably around 57 authorised prescribers of medicinal cannabis doctors in the country. Now, other doctors will be using the special access scheme, which means they just apply each time a patient comes in. And if the patient comes in you know, for a repeat, they reapply. So there, we don't know how many doctors are, are using the special access scheme. But this is all brought about because in Australia, cannabis is considered an unapproved good by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Okay. And so until they approve it, um, then the doctors have to go through, I guess, these hoops to prescribe it. Got it. And do you think that, that will happen at some stage? Look, I uh, think there's an argument for cannabidiol, CBD, to be taken off Schedule 4 totally because okay. it's been shown by the World Health Organisation to have a, a good safety profile with low toxicity. So for me, as a herbalist, I don't see why you should be treating um, CBD products uh, any different to any other herbal medicine. So they should be regulated as a herbal medicine like they are in this country through what they call the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. So they can be um, listed or registered on the ARTG and that's where I think it should go. Now that's not happening at the moment um, but I hope that, that that's where it goes in the future and I hope that the TGA also approve it formally so that it's no longer considered an unapproved medicine and therefore doctors don't have to do 
something special to prescribe this that they don't have to do with other drugs. Got it. Yeah. And can you like with CBD or because as you said, that's class four, not class eight, like THC yep. with CBD, yep. then can that be abused? Can you over dosage on this and, and get yourself into a mess? Because I, I just think of what's out there when you yep. got yeah. Look, when you look at the clinical studies that have, have been done on it, um, they have used reasonably high doses of it without any great adverse effects. But having said that, CBD can interact with some, some pharmaceutical medic, uh, medicines. So that's why it's really important to have it prescribed by a healthcare practitioner that, that knows what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the same with any herb. You know, St. John's wort, for example, will interact with a range of different yeah. medications. The Chinese herb danchen does as well. Ginseng does. So it's important that it is prescribed rather than people, I guess, self-medicating. So, um, you know, no herbal medicine, I think, is completely safe. And yes, you know, you could... Cons no one's ever died from a cannabis overdose, by the way, simply because... Um, we don't have, I guess, the receptors in that part of the brain that control our, our heart and our breathing. So there haven't been any recorded overdoses of, of cannabis, smoking or taking it medicinally or otherwise. But I guess with um, CBD, yes, you can get some side effects with it. And, um, uh, and as I said, it can interact with some pharmaceutical medications. So, you know, they're, they're, yeah. it's like any herb. You, you've got to be careful with them. But, but I think as well, when it comes to, um, any, like you said, again, any herb and anything that we do, it, it yep. should be supported already by lifestyle changes that are required. Yep. That's right. That might yep. be causing the problems in the first place Look, as well. I think that's, if, if I've learned anything from studying Chinese medicine, is to look at the root cause of illness. So, um, you know, I don't think medicinal cannabis is the magic bullet. I think it's part of a holistic approach mm -hmm. to lifestyle. And that may include conventional medicine. Um, but it, it, importantly, it's stress reduction, it's exercise, it's diet, it's getting out in the sunshine and getting enough vitamin D on your, you know, um, created in your body. All those things are, and sleep, you know, all those things, as you know, um, are really important to look at holistically. So yeah. I think that, you know, it, it's part of, um, I guess, um, an approach that, that should be a, a holistic approach. Yeah, totally, totally. And another uh, question that popped in there that I wanted to raise anyway is mm. around the the, the, um, the legalities of once you've been prescribed it. So like for driving, for instance, was yep. one, if you've got CBD or THC, obviously they're two different. That's right. So again, yeah. in Australia, it's illegal to have any amount of THC in your body um, if you're driving. So if you get pulled over, you'll you'll be done. So, um, and, and it doesn't matter whether you've, been, if you've got a prescription in your hand or not. It doesn't matter. So our um, driving laws need to be changed. I actually had um, lunch with our Prime Minister earlier this year. And I brought up that issue because we all got, you know, the chance to have, to talk about one thing. So my, um, you know, my issue was talking about medicinal cannabis and driving laws. And I said, do you realise that if you pulled over um, and you... Um, you know, you, you, you're done, basically, if you've got THC in your system. And he said, well, can't you just hand over your prescription? And I said, no, you can't. That would be logical, but you can't. And, you know, there are a lot other pharmaceutical medications that are going to impair you much more than, than that. For sure. So this is something that really does need to be changed because, you know, it will put people off being prescribed medicinal cannabis, which has got tetrahydrocannabinol in it, and they may need a little bit of it, um, you know, for their medical condition because they're worried about being caught either driving, you know, or, or perhaps at work too. Yeah. So it's a problem and it, and it does need to be addressed. So another barrier again there really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, what, like, so what are, what are, how do other countries mm. adopt this and where are they at? Look, it, it varies. So um, I guess in the US, um, cannabis is still federally a Schedule I prohibited drug. However, um, different states have ad adopted their own, I guess, laws around it. So I think there's around 33 states in the US that have um, legalised the medical use of medicinal cannabis. And they have varying lists, I guess, of conditions where um, a person is you know, approved to be able to use it. 
Um, and they've, about 10 states have legalised it for recreational use as well. Now in Canada, um, they've had um, medicinal use for a while and last year they legalised recreational use. So it means that people are now able to grow their own plants. Um, I think it's either four or six, I can't remember, um, without um, any problems um, for their own personal use. Whereas in Australia, you can't grow your own cannabis plants. And you know, some people have been doing it. There was a report on, I think Channel 7 earlier, I think it was actually last year, about a, a father who was um, juicing the leaves and, and, and flowers, obviously, of the plant um, to help his daughters out who had inflammatory bowel conditions. And they were in dreadful um, trouble with it. And it helped them tremendously. But he got caught by, you know, caught, caught by the police. And I think he got let off with a, a slap on the wrist. However, you know, we shouldn't be in that position. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's a fundamental human right for people to be able to access, um, you know, medicines um, where, the, where it can help them. Yeah. And I don't think it's the right of the government to tell you that it should be a last resort and not a first line resort. If someone wants to choose that as a first line of resort, you know, for their medical condition, they should have the right to do that in consultation with a healthcare practitioner. Absolutely. And surely as well, if everything is pointing this way, we, we want to be able to know quality control is there yeah. as well. And yeah. so. And I guess this is what Australia does very well with complementary medicines. The TGA, to their credit, um, have very stringent quality control mechanisms for complementary medicines as well as conventional medicines. So um, at the moment, um, a lot of the medicinal cannabis products are being imported from other countries. The um, importation requirements are quite strict in terms of quality control. So that's a good thing. And I guess um, the, the difficulty is, though, that medicinal cannabis is very expensive to buy in Australia. And so a lot of people, I guess, are turning to that black market supply because it's cheaper. Yeah. And of course, with a black market supply, you, you don't know what you're getting. So, you know, um, I, I think it's important that we change things such that it brings the prices down so that you've got high quality, you know, products, but at an accessible amount. I mean, it could cost you in excess of $300 a month for a supply of medicinal cannabis. If you've got epilepsy or you're using it for, you know, cancer related issues, then you might need a much higher dose of that. And then the price is going to be prohibitive. Yeah, of course. So this yeah. is a big problem as well. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Wow. Um, that, I was debating which way to jump in here because there's two things I want to do. I want to recap on literally everything that we've said just to refresh mm. on, on our minds. And I know as well, I understand that you're writing a book mm. on all of this. Maybe let's go there first. And okay. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I'm writing a book um, that's focused on um, medicinal cannabis and mental health. And I guess the reason for that is that a lot of people turn to medicinal cannabis, the literature shows us that, for mental health problems. So um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago um, on integrative oncology, and it's a similar approach that I'm taking is to basically compile the evidence um, to and, 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 you know, and against um, does it work for different mental health conditions. I'm writing it with a, a fabulous um, doctor in the US, um, Professor, sorry, not Professor, he's Colonel, Dr. Philip Blair, and he's a retired army doctor and he works as a physician now. He's a medicinal cannabis expert. So um, he and I are co-authoring the book together. Amazing. Well, when, when can we expect that to come out? The deadline, I've got to have it finished, is June next year. So fairly soon after. Um, look, it is, it's, uh, it's, it's written for, I guess, healthcare professionals. So it's a, it's a slightly heavier read because yeah. it really is putting the, the scientific evidence got behind it. it, which is really important. Um, you know, for doctors to understand that it does have a, a scientific evidence base here. It's not just someone's opinion. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. But I think as well, these conversations, like this, this conversation will reach thousands of people over the next few months. And, yeah. and it's, it really is important, you know, to be educated, to get past the whole belief systems around it, like we said, the way I, I think it's kind of gets caught up in society. So maybe let's recap everything that we yeah. kind of covered. I, 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 so... So just to start, um, medicinal cannabis is, I guess, different to marijuana or to, yep. to the way we, we see it. That's right. 
it affects the cannabinoid system within yes. the body, which directly yep. affects inflammation yep. and yep. the homeostasis. And, and it also affects other systems in other okay. um, neurotransmitter systems as well. So it, it's um, CBD in particular doesn't have such a high affinity for those cannabis receptors I talked about, cannabinoid receptors rather, not cannab cannabis. Um, it it in, um, acts on other targets in the body. So you can see how wide ranging, you know, yeah, even the, just those two components are. When, when would one use CBD to then THC then? Look, it depends on very much on the medical condition. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, a, very, a very deep conversation. But yes, yeah, we could yeah. go on for about three hours on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, again, why we we really need to go and see a doctor to help us look that's at right. our case study that have been that are up to speed on this as well. That's right. Which, which I guess is the most important point to to raise as well. So then. Once they go and see a doctor, one of the 57 currently, is there a list of those doctors? Anywhere? No, no, there isn't a, a list, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so I guess it's um, at the moment, it's, it's word of mouth, although okay. um, I, I'm hoping that will sort of change in the future. Um, we don't have a society over here that's focus on cannabinoid medicine like they do in the US. Right, okay. Uh, so it's a little bit harder, but um, what we're doing through the Global Health Initiative Australia is that, you know, we've decided we'll try and compile a, um, a, a directory of doctors who allow their names to be on it. And so people could come to our website and have a look and, and see if they can find someone um, that way. Yeah, fantastic. And then once they see the doctor and the doctor can then prescribe them accurately the, the, yeah. what they need and the dosage, yep. where does that then get ordered from? Does the doctor then order it for the, the person? They get a prescription and they have to take that to the, um, the chemist. And yep. The chemist has to then contact the um, company and that gets um, brought over to the chemist. Beautiful. And then they are able to dispense it. Yeah. I mean, there are some compounding pharmacists, having said that, who will compound their own. Um, but by and large, if they're buying something that's already in a bottle. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I think mm. that's, we've covered so many um, topics today, Carly. That was brilliant. I really appreciate yeah. it. And you look, if people want to nerd out even more on this, yeah. can I, can I, is this somewhere I can send them to you or is yes. there a website? Or? Yeah, look, um, Global Health Initiative Australia, we set that up earlier this year to focus on education um, for not only healthcare practitioners, but also the public. So at the moment, um, we are, we join hands with um, the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine to um, run conferences together. And we've got our um, first joint conference in February in Brisbane next year. Now that's mostly for healthcare practitioners, um, but they can go to ghiaustralia.org.au or they can go to the ACNAM website to get information on that. But what we're also wanting to do, because we are a not-for-profit organisation, is start to uh, build up a bank of, of short videos that the general public can access for free as well. So awesome. again, if, if people want to sort of learn more about it, I'd say go to our website um, next year and we'll start to have a bank of, as I said, um, videos that are for the public. So they're not going to be too heavily sort of peppered with jargon. And as well, we'll have our own online um, and face-to-face -face education for doctors and other healthcare pro uh, professionals. Fantastic. And anyone listening to this today, um, if you hit pause, you'll scroll down. All those links and resources will be there for you anyway. So um, if you want to find out any more. Uh, Kylie, look, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I learned That's heaps right. then. Good. Um, that, was, that was brilliant. And I'm, I'm just excited to be able to share this message with other people that I know are very curious about it. So, yeah, so fantastic. Thank you for your time and all that you do. My pleasure. Thank you.